Okay, thank you for being on time. You just send the last message and then uh, we go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I think we can start. So with the second uh, lecture of uh, uh, Tanya, so maybe, okay. Hello, okay. thank you. Very good, okay. So did we start recording? Okay, okay, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. So today is our second lecture, and it will be primarily about information maximization in neural circuits. So we will talk about, so as a recap, last week, uh, we discussed uh, the basic concepts of information theory, entropy, um, derived how Shannon entropy follows from three uh, postulates. Additivity, in independence, and branching process. And then today we will discuss maximal informative nonlinearities. And this morning in my email, when I opened my email, I had a question from a colleague who doesn't work on neuroscience, but he was asking a question Can a neuron transmit more than one bit of information? So we will discuss that. And um, um, we will talk about entropy and information for a Gaussian variable um, and an approximation when the noise is small and uh, optimal nonlinearities in that case. And um, example applications from both neural circuits and a small application from the fruit fly development. So my first question, is there any overlap between this plan and uh, what you heard uh, earlier um, uh, today and maybe yesterday. I cannot hear, but I will take it as a no. Okay, so I actually, I, I think it would be good to have some um, connection back from the audience or at least test the connection. <clears throat> Sorry? Yes, that's good. All right, good. Now, now I hear something, okay. So um, I guess that's the plan. If <clears throat> there are any corrections, then we can move forward and um, I will start and maybe it will be for the next uh, uh, lecture, depending on how many questions there will be, information transmission by multiple neurons. So um, probably, <coughs> there's a question. Mm, thank you, Colin. So probably mm, you, um, uh, we discussed it qualitatively, but now, um, because this is a basic formula for many of the analysis. So we will talk about the equation for information transmission and various views, uh, kind of various, in various forms. It's the same equation, but in various forms. So the first statement is that, as we discussed last time, the, um, the information here is the difference between the entropy of um, um, the neural response minus this entropy of the neural response given a state of the system. So in other words, like from the examples that I described um, last time, this is the entropy of, if you're asking me questions, this is the entropy of my answers, whether I say yes or no sometimes. If I only say yes, this entropy is zero. Then if I say yes or no, uh, with some probability, then we have a, a non-zero entropy. And so 
uh, have a capacity for conveying information, but this can be offset by the entropy of um, my answers when you repeat the same question twice. So that's the basic premise of information. And now mathematically, so the entropy of the variable y is uh, the integral of the probability distribution p of y log of 2 p of y. And then, so this minus becomes a plus and we are integrating over the probability distributions of signals x. And then for a given x, we have the same equation as we had here, but now conditional on x. So it's the integral dy p of y given x and log two p of y given x and the bracket is cut off here. So <clears throat> you can notice that uh, even though there is no x in the first integral, you can add it in. So I just added an integral dx and dy and p of y uh, beca um, became p of x and y. Hmm. This should be p of y. And then uh, here with this integral is dx and dy comes here. And uh, <clears throat> p of x and p of y given x combine into the probability distribution of joint p of x and y. <clears throat> so then we have um, um, p of x and y, p of x and y log two, and then um, I mean, I guess it's symmetric p of y in x divided by p of x. So um, that's the, and it's called mutual information because you can write it as p of y, uh, maybe I'll write on the board. Um, so we have, <clears throat> So that is equal to dx dy p of x and y logarithm p of um, y and x over p of y and p of x. So this should be p of y here, and this is p of y. Okay. Yeah, so... uh, maybe, uh, maybe Mateo, you can write on the blackboard if yeah. it's not clear. Yes, I'm writing on the blackboard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So then um, we um, we have here. Let's see. Okay. So now we. This is our equation that you see on the blackboard, and it's called the mutual information because. It is um, an integral between x and y, and it is symmetric. So instead of writing on the first line entropy of response minus entropy of response given y, you can also write it as entropy of x, uh, how much the entropy is in the source, minus the entropy of x and y. And you can also write this as entropy of x plus entropy of y minus the joint entropy of x and y. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Maybe write that, um, Mate, would you mind? So this will be for our reference. Okay, thank you so much. So, <coughs> okay. So
So then we have a question. I have a so I will have an example. This is um, in many neuroscience papers, but this is uh, um, the expression that I will discuss is from um, uh, Nama Brenner working with Bill Bialik, but this particular recording is, is actually from um, uh, Lauren Zinchich with whom I collaborated as a postdoc. So in this case, you have a visual stimulus sequence shown on top. And this is a primate retinal neuron. And there are many, many trials, 50 trials, or maybe even more. So you see that, it, you know, it is like very reliable. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a machine. Um, you, you put the, the signal in and you can see a clear patterns of the neural responses. <laughs> So now we would like to evaluate information that this neuron transmits. So instead of integral over dx, which is written on the board, you can have integral over time because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, stimulus and time. And then we are comparing the entropy of responses across time, uh, P of R, and we are comparing the entropy of responses. So entropy this way. We are comparing the entropy of responses for a given time. And so the, um, you know, people compute the spike probability, which is shown in R, uh, in red. Uh, this is just by averaging all these little dots. So one more time, this is called the raster plot. And each dot is a spike. And the, this is one trial, this is another trial. So the trials go this way. And in red is the average probability of a spike in the given bin. So um, it never quite reaches one. So if it reached one, it would be 100% reliable, but you, you can see the, the range of variability. And here in the bottom, I have an equation, which is actually a rewrite of the equation that we have on the board. Uh, it's information, but um, divided by the rate of the neurons. So you can see that um, the neuron is in two states, P of 0 and P of 1, binary, and in integral over time, dt, this is um, a kind of probability. Um, uh, instead of integral over x, we have this integral. Then R of t means uh, probability of response y given time t, r of t. Um, and then this is probability of y given x, meaning y given t, divided by um, probability of y overall. And this is normalized by average um, rate of spikes. So this is information in spikes. So now I have a few questions um, for you about this equation. So first, we always say that information reflects um, and characterizes uncertainty in neural responses. And sometimes reviewers ask the following question. Here is my expression for information. And it's only based on the average neuronal firing rate um, as a function of time, there is no, um, there is no kind of expression for how variable is delta R. So how come information characterizes variability of neural responses if the equation that we got um, doesn't use it? So you mean it doesn't depend on the stimulus? No, it does depend on the stimulus. This is our uh, T. Um, it, it does depend on the stimulus um, implicitly because um, if I take, uh, and we can also talk about it, if I take a, a smaller segment of time, then in, in practical terms, this expression will change. But even for a given uh, set of time, uh, there is no... Um, R of t is the mean firing rate of a neuron at the time t. So there is no, uh, in, there is no contribution. Where is the uh, delta R? 
as a function of t? Shouldn't we have a, a delta r? So for example, here in this red graph, this is the average firing rate, but I haven't told you um, why, um, you know, what, what's the, you know, what is the variability in neural? Of course, okay, the equation is correct and um, information is based on variability. So it is a somewhat of an unfair question, but uh, because it does come up in the review, uh, in reviewer comments from time to time, uh, I think it's, and it's kind of an interesting, uh, um, the, way I, the way I answer it, um, you know, I think it is useful exercise to um, think whether we are understanding um, everything that's written here. So, so I, I can start giving out hints. So the question is, why does this does not depend on uh, uh, the fluctuations of R of T? Right. Yes. Yes. So, in other words, yeah. Okay. Any? Any guess? I mean. Well, it, my know, guess it, would be that it does. Actually, so in the sense that uh, if you write R of t as R bar plus delta R then uh, mm -hmm. this would have a contribution proportional to delta r squared. Okay, so Matteo gets A plus. <laughs> 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 um, but um, the, the idea is that we also have a model of the neural response here. I, I told you we assume that this is a binary neural response. So we treat it as a binary zero one. And this is the probability uh, that it will produce uh, a response, R of t. So for a binary neuron, if I know the mean, I already know the variance. Mm -hmm. So if I tell you that the mean is one, you know that the variance is zero. If I told you that the mean is zero, then you also know that the variance is zero. If I told you that the mean is 0.5, you know that the variance is maximal. So right. given, given our model of um, that this is a binary neuron, if I know R, I also, you know, you know, P of R and, you know, doesn't depend on any, you know, for a given time, this is P of R, it's a binary neuron. So I also know the variability, I know the entropy. So information, Yes, it reflects the uncertainty, but in our case, I can um, I know the uncertainty um, once I know the mean. It's like for a Poisson process. Some of you know about Poisson process. Once I specify the mean, I also specify the variance. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. So, you know, this is, um, um, comes up in the, you know, as I said, I, I received it um, a few times as a, when submitting a paper. So I hope this is, will be useful. This is an, um, another question that comes up. So another question that I, um, and then, you know, some application of this is um, in more detail, um, just uh, practically, oh, I don't know what happened here. Um, this is an example of uh, application. So it, this is an example of recording from um, a thalamus of, um, so in the brain, the visual signals start in the retina, they go through a relay nucleus in the middle of the head, and then they go back to visual cortex. So this is a recording from this relay neurons uh, deep inside the brain. And uh, you can put an electrode next to a neuron. And uh, this is um, called um, an interesting situation. Uh, they are called S potentials. So you're recording responses from one neuron, but you can also see signatures of what was the input to that neuron. So here is um, 
the reconstructed spike train from the retina. And sorry. And then this is uh, the um, reconstructed spike train from um, uh, the thalamus, lateral geniculus nucleus. So that's the abbreviation LGN. So even though you're doing one recording, you can actually reconstruct two signals. One is the input signal, and the other one is um, the output signal. And so we can measure information transmission across this um, synapse. And uh, um, by doing this subtraction procedure that I will skip over. Um, and uh, now we can um, analyze this. So they're both driven by the same signal. One is in the retina, and then we record here in the thalamus in the LGN, and we see signatures of both neurons, um, the incoming neuron and the outcoming neuron. So while well, it turns out that, as you saw from that recording, not every input spike generates the output spike. So in general, the the retina, the input signal produces more spikes than the output signal. But then um, it turns out that the in LGN, the thalamus, produces more information than the retinal signal. So when you multiply these two together, actually you can have some cases where uh, the information is not lost for some neurons. So it, um, really operates without any information loss. Any questions about this part? So this is uh, um, a, an example analysis that was obtained using this example formula between um, um, that uh, we discussed, which is R of T divided by average R log r of t divided by average r. And Matthias, would you mind writing that equation down uh, yes. uh, for so, reference? So this is uh, information. In the spike train for um, carried by this um, average neuron with an average firing rate, r of t. By uh, neuron. So I have a question. So, uh, essentially, this is, uh, there is a minus sign here or not? No, I don't think so. So, we have information, uh, integral, I can't quite see the blackboard, but I think it should be um, R of T over average R log R of T over average R without a minus sign. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this looks like an entropy, but uh, because one over t is a probability distribution, but but this is not a probability, no? It's a normalized, so it's, it's information a, per spike. So maybe add on the left hand side that this is information per spike, because we normalized it by every r bar. So if we didn't normalize it by the r bar, it uh, would be. Okay. So you say it would be a probability. So you you say say for example yes you have uh, n uh, repetition of the experiments right. So yes. essentially R of t is essentially one over n uh, times uh, number of uh, neurons uh, spiking. Uh, I mean number of times uh, neuron yes. spikes at t. Okay. So essentially, uh, if you divide, uh, then, then uh, R bar should be uh, this averaged over T, right? Yes. So essentially, R of T divided by R bar should be uh, essentially a probability of having a spike uh, at T. So if you look at a random spike, what is the, uh, so it's uh, number of spikes 
at time t divided by total number of spikes. Yes. Okay. Is this clear? Okay. So then, uh, uh, if this is a probability, then uh, I think this should be negative, right? Or not? So no, no somehow it's not negative. So if you look on the left side, in terms of um, uh, information, we know that we have P of uh, Y given X divided by uh, P of Y. On the left hand side, the one that you wrote here, yes. So we have um, integral over dx and dy, um, p of x and y, and then you can have p of y and uh, given x divided by p of x. Okay, so... So p of y is r and x is t. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so, the, the, so here the... Um... Uh, okay, okay, and then uh, these two are one essentially in the sense that uh, you're saying that X and Y are uniform. Um, X is uniform and Y, which is R, is not uniform, but binary. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Ah, yes, that's a good point. So y, um, so y uh, takes two values. If on the left-hand side, on the left panel, on the blackboard, y takes two values, 0 and 1. Yes. Yes, this uh, y takes value 0 and 1. So this is the spike, right? This is the spike. And so... then if you could write... Yes, go ahead. Y is a spike, is a spike, and uh, X is a random time between 0 and T. So, and then uh, this uh, should be something like a mutual information uh, between spike uh, and T. This is the idea? Yes. So in information, which is uh, kind of a general expression, we should really write uh, sum over Y equals 0 and 1. So we will have P of Y given uh, equals to 0 given X over P of X and P of Y given uh, equals to 1 given X over yeah. p of y given one. And yeah, then so, so. what will happen, yes, that p of y, uh, when it uh, doesn't spike, because if the spikes are rare, then that term kind of it goes almost to zero. And so you're left with a contribution that y is equal to one. So yes, only spikes. Okay, so, so this is essentially would be R P of X and Y, essentially, where essentially, so this is a joint distribution of having a spike and having time T, right? Yes, yes. Uh, or maybe, uh, um, you should divide uh, this by, by T, actually. Yes, you should divide this by T, I guess. And then, uh, yes, I think uh, the idea is that, say, this, uh, say, uh, this divided by T is the joint probability to choose uh, 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 a time T uniformly between Z and T and that the neuron spikes, okay? And then uh, uh, the P of T, which is, would be P of X, would be just uh, 1 over t, which is essentially this 1 over t here. And, yes. uh, and p of y 
is just uh, R bar. So if you put all these things together, you should get uh, this formula. Is it clear? Okay. More or less, this is an exercise for you to check that this is a mutual information. Okay? Yes. So, um, this um, a few more comments about this expression. Um, so, if um, R of T is not very modulated, so imagine that instead of being so modulated, it's very, very small, a kind of constant plus small modulation. So, in this case, R of T by average R bar will be approximately one plus corrections. So in that case, the information will be very small. So when you look at this red trace, if it is not very modulated, you will know that the information is small. Yeah. And um, another comment, which is uh, interesting, um, is um, uh, how many of you know about Rennie entropies? One. Suppose. One, very good. So what we have huh? here. Ah, question. We have a question. Just wait, uh, I'll bring you the mic. So, so that, uh, thanks. In the joint probability distribution, okay. In the joint probability distribution, uh, we know that they are independent because we can see so the mutual information should be zero. Yes, yeah, so if the two variables are independent, the information will be zero. No, 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 but uh, why you say that they are independent? So in because the is the spiking is not uniform in time. There are some times when uh, there are a lot of spikes, huh? but sometimes when the, the, with the probability to have a spike yeah. depends on time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's so, a very good question. Yep. That if you have, um, if you look on the expression on the left um, side of the board, like general expression between x and y, then if the two variables are independent, then p of x and y is given is equal to the product of p of x times p of y. And so the expression under the logarithm will be one, and information will be zero. Yeah. So it is true that um, if you have two independent variables, then the information will be zero. And in our expression, if um, R does not depend on time, meaning it does not depend on the stimulus, then um, R of T divided by average R will be one and um, information will be zero. So imagine that the neural responses in the brain um, are influenced by the stimuli, but also by internal thoughts. So, you know, um, I suppose I'm listening to the concert, but I am really working on my um, paper. So, you know, in some cases, the neurons will be very activated by what I'm typing. But if I try to compute information with what I'm listening, um, you know, it will be zero. Well, um, mm -hmm. so there are other assumptions that go into this equation. And um, <clears throat> um, we... Um, you know, I, I don't know what we will have an exam, but uh, uh, maybe I can assign some homework problems with um, that you can um, then deliver during the exam um, with example data sets. So, for example, what happens if um, you have not uh, 50 trials, but 20 trials? And uh, what happens if instead of, you know, is it okay to record for one hour or I can record for 10 seconds? 
So those are practical questions. And uh, in general, and, and then we will discuss them. We can discuss um, them in, in a moment. So information is a positive quantity. So even if the two variables are independent and information should be zero, then when I compute a given sequence, um, you will get a non-zero answer. You will have a positive answer. And uh, so you might say that there was information. So the technique against this, there are, there are several, but one of the kind of robust with minimal assumptions is the so-called extrapolate to the infinite data set size. So I will digress a little bit and give you an example from everyday life about um, superstitions, right? So, um, you know, example from my from uh, my life is um, one, one of my students went um, on a trip. She brings me back a necklace as a gift. I put in a necklace. I call my program officer. They say, Tanya, your grant has been funded. I was so happy. So then. Um, I say, well, what's the correlation? I wear the necklace, I get, <laughs> I get my grant. So um, this is an example. If I do not have enough um, length kind of example recording, you can have finite information where really the information should be zero. Yeah. So um, an example of this recording, you can say, suppose I have um, 50 trials, which is what was recorded. I use this expression, I compute the number. Then instead of taking 50 recordings, you can take 45 recordings randomly, a subset. You compute information, and information that you will get is positive, will be larger. And um, actually, the first person who um, wrote about this was... Um, uh, from Trieste was uh, Alessandro Travis. So we can, we can go over his paper, um, the upward bias in information theory. Um, but uh, the reason I brought up Rainy entropies, so I would like to ask you, Matteo, would you mind crossing the logarithm? So uh, first of the, uh, before that, uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, it's about... Uh, aged versus uh, young neurons. So I think the question is that uh, uh, whether there is a, a way, uh, is there any experimental evidence uh, from which aged neurons uh, would have larger information loss? So whether the information content depends on the age of the neuron? I think this is a very interesting question. I don't know. Um, I don't know an experimental test to it because um, you have to record from the same neuron multiple times as the animal ages substantially. So I think um, it might be possible in an insect, but. Um, I don't think it has been done. So people, you know, we could do, um, one could do a study saying, on average, this um, brain area or neurons of this type convey so much information and uh, say, well, if we take older animals, they will have less information. Hmm. So I, I don't, I mean, that, that it would be possible. And certainly during development, one can, one can do this, um, but I don't know the study here. Um, okay. And uh, um, yeah, so, but um, what we do know, um, something from um, what we are looking at is, uh, um, you can also, uh, like in the general variability, and um, in general variability increases with age, and, um, um, you know, some, one of the book is uh, by Schrodinger, What is Life? And then he says that um, it is, 
kind of uh, when the entropy increases beyond. Um, so as, as we leave our entropy, the organism can only, um, you know, entropy is increasing. And then when, when it's more than uh, can be controlled, then that's that. Um, and there is experimental evidence for that. So there is a paper, I would say, within the past two years on variability in um, um, blood samples and um, also how quickly a person can recover from perturbation. And that variability does increase with age. And using this variability and projecting where one over variability goes to zero, they predicted the maximum lifespan for a human of about 120 to 150 years of age. <clears throat> so that's a study you can uh, look up the, uh, it's called um, you know, human, maximum human lifespan. And um, so that, um, it, it, it's interesting that in, in that study, they measure both uh, variability even in the movement. So it turns out that I would, you know, my my initial guess would be that as a, uh, we get older, we move less. But it turns out that not only we move less, but also variability, bouts of movement also increases. So I'm guessing that, you know, a young child bounces constantly, doesn't stop at all. And uh, if I go for a walk, I go for a walk, but then maybe I will take a rest. So the variability in um, the amount of movement also increases with age, um, which, is, which is interesting. So there are these general ideas about entropy and um, 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 kind of life, which are not necessarily in, uh, been studied, not for neurons at the level of spiking, but for neurons in the level of um, gene expression and also behavioral variability and also blood samples. So the idea is that you have um, perturbations and so how quickly the person can recover from perturbations. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. that variability also correlates with the time, kind of response time, mm -hmm. um, autocorrelation time in the, in the sequence. So yeah, this was- oh, okay. um, so we have that Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so th this is maybe a longer uh, question, but uh, I think it's more useful than um, to respond to questions. Um, okay, so now we can go back to so, our uh, uh, yes? Tanya, we have a question from Jacopo. Just a moment. Thank you. I haven't understood completely why are we computing this mutual information with the time at, we are not taking into account the stimuli I, I haven't understood mm -hmm. the passage from the stimuli to the t just the time and not the stimuli at time t yes so um yes so let me write uh, down um or maybe Matteo will, can you write down that yeah. one over t integral over dt is actually um, sum over stimuli p of s. Oh, so so uh, can you repeat that? So one over uh, t. Let's let's put it in a box. Um, one over t integral from zero to t dt. Yeah. Equals integral over ds p of s well this this both are one no 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 but uh, i mean that there will be something to multiply this so um we can make instead of the so, equal sign we can make an arrow so, so may i suggest one thing uh, yes. uh tanya that essentially this uh, should be an upper bound uh, to the mutual information between the spike uh, and the stimuli, no? because, uh, because of the uh, data processing inequality. So if the, spike, if the stimulus depends on T, 
then uh, this is clearly an upper bound to the mutual information between the spikes and the stimuli, right? So there are two comments. So I, I will just tell you um, fr from papers. So we can discuss whether that's correct or not. So what people say, in the, you know, this is Bill Bialik's paper. So they say there is a, in the context of these experimental studies, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between stimulus and time. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, so then uh, stimulus is a function of time. One-to-one. Yeah, one-to-one, one. okay. So if stimulus is a function of time, one-to-one, one, then this is the same thing, exactly. But and let's then say, for example, uh, in this picture, you have that uh, uh, for different time, you have the same value of the stimulus, right? Yes, so, so yes. So there are two questions, two comments to this. So on one hand, you can say that, well, actually, if the stimulus is defined as really the light intensity at one moment in time, then there are many different, if I cross, draw a line here, at many different times, I have the same stimulus. Yeah. So th that is not true. But then they say, well, actually, the stimulus is not just the light intensity at this time, but this history of um, light intensity, and it's true. So, and the neuron responds not just the specific light intensity at one moment in time, but to its history. And so if we look okay. at the history, then all There's of these segments one are unique. Uh, correspondence between time and history. Yes. Okay. And um, this is, question is important because it also is related to the question of how long should my recording be? Mm -hmm. Because um, if my recording is very short, then I have not probed um, the probability distribution of stimuli sufficiently. So the sum over stimuli P of X, P of S, that will not really be well modeled by the integral over time because mm -hmm. this segment was too short. Yeah. And and so we will have um, kind of not a, comp not a complete answer. So this equation assumes, quote unquote, ergodic assumption that our history of stimuli here have probed um, the, mm -hmm. the full range of stimuli sufficiently mm -hmm. well. Okay. okay. So should we go, uh, go ahead. So now it also, the related point is that, um, you know, P of S, but I can have different P of S. So sometimes in this case, this is the intensity of stimuli that is taken from um, natural world as in uh, uh, pixels of an image. And then they were scanned to the retina. But I, instead of, and so it's a little bit more picky as you can see, but I can use a Gaussian distribution of light intensities and it will be a different distribution. So the, the amount of information that the neuron conveys will depend on the probability distribution of stimuli. If uh, P of, you know, because it also depends on the entropy of the stimulus, it's a mutual information. So sometimes what has been published is that the entropy of the neural response, uh, mutual, neurons convey more mutual information when our stimuli are taken from the natural environment. And they will convey less information when our P of S is taken from kind of um, a Gaussian ensemble. Okay. So that's um, another um, another comment. So people have studied that many different kinds of um, neurons respond more vigorously to stimuli taken from natural scenes compared to a Gaussian distribution. Mm -hmm. 
the disadvantage of that statement is that um, how do you define nature of stimuli and their probability distribution? So for a long time, I would say that there is no definition for this um, because we know that the natural stimuli are not Gaussian. There is a lot of fluctuations and um, um, one can approximate maybe as a modulated Gaussian process, but you know, bringing back hyperbolic geometry a little bit, although I wasn't planning for this lecture to do this, we have um, the natural stimuli with being a com combination of um, uh, signals from multiple sources. If we model them as arising from hierarchical network, or maybe, and as therefore, as a set of stimuli in a uniformly sampled hyperbolic space, then we will have a probability distribution of natural stimuli. Okay, okay so we okay. have another question. Yeah, so there is another question, uh, uh, well, specific, uh, technical. So would the Nyquist criterion be sufficient to know the needed length uh, of the recording based on the stimuli? Now we should say what is the Nyquist uh, criterion. Um. So I think um, uh, I, I know one answer with respect to spatial information of hand, but let's try to think about this um, in the temporal domain. So let's look at, I'll look at the question again. So, uh, the Nyquist criterion be sufficient to know the needed lengths of the recording based on the stimuli. So I'm guessing that. I guess what, the answer is yes, because the Nyquist criterion is exactly how much you should sample uh, a signal in order to, to have uh, um, a reliable estimate. I, I'm not sure. I, I was thinking of the Nyquist frequency, so it will, I think, determine what is the frequency of content of stimuli that I should use. So th that was my planned answer. But yeah. maybe when the, is Nyquist criterion is different from the Nyquist frequency? Uh, no, I think uh, well, there is a Nyquist-Shannon uh, sampling uh, theorem. Okay. which I think is what uh, the questions refer to, uh, the question refers to. And I would, I would think, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, this is what the, and I think uh, this is what uh, uh, this criterion would be sufficient, uh, I imagine. So let me look this up. Um, I. You know, okay, so so far the answer is yes, but uh, I, I have to think about it. Maybe you can uh, have a look at it and then uh, you can post the answer on Slack. Okay. So should we go back to Rainy entropies? Yes, so um, I will, so another um, reviewer comment that you sometimes can get is um, says, oh, but you know, because of all these samples, um, sampling difficulties and the upward um, bias in information theory, I need a lot of recordings. I don't want to do it. I will just compute variance, okay? So um, now, what, what does it mean variance? So now if you notice here, and you we have in this equation, we have log, base two, or you can just say in the natural log up to a scaling change. So now let's remove the natural log at all. This one. Yeah, so let's remove it. And instead R of T to average R, we are gonna write in some power. So right now what we get is the one over T integral DT 
r of t over average r to the power of two. Okay, so now if, um, Matteo, if you can rewrite r of t, um, you know, if we write minus one, maybe, write minus one, uh... minus one, um, and uh, uh, bring it to, so somehow it should equal to the variance in neural responses. Okay, so, so, it so you be... want me to write uh, r of t as uh... R bar R plus, plus delta, delta R. Of t. Yes. Okay, so then uh, this is 1 over t integral dt of uh, 1 plus delta R over R bar t squared. squared. And so, so that's 1. This will be then 1 the, plus essentially. Then your term disappears because of uh, uh, delta r, uh, the variance of r of t yeah. divided by r bar squared, right? Yeah. So what we have is that instead of the logarithm, you can write r of t over r, or you can write r of t to the r bar to the any power, actually. Okay, so and, this to the n power. Yes, and then what it what that is is um, the Rennie entropy, Rennie information. So the Rennie entropy is um, like kullback leibler distance is uh, our information p of x log p of x, but the Rennie entropy is p of x to some power, mm -hmm. and um, so when we talk about information, this is a specific version of the Rennie divergence between uh, R of T and R bar, but you can have any power. And if you remove the log, then you're getting the variance. And so all of the statements about uh, biases that exist for information they also apply to variance. So therefore, when um, people say, oh, you know, information is so complicated, I don't want to do it, it has all these biases, um, I will compute variance. But actually, the bias in information is less than the bias in the variance, because variance is also biased. But because we are so used to it, we don't think about the fact that variance is also biased. And uh, in other words, so this is also highlights the intuition between um, information and variance. So if I say um, this variable accounts for so much variance in neural response, okay, that's a statement, but you can also say this variable accounts for so much information in neural response, and those are, are related things. And uh, you can actually show that this kullback leibler distance has the smallest um, um, kind of error bar and it saturates with the so-called uh, Kramer-Rao bound and um, is more efficient than high order Rennie entropies. Okay. okay, so we have a lot of questions in the chat. So the difference using Rennie entropy versus Shannon entropy um, for firing neurons. Yeah, so the difference is that, um, let me, I will try to write here. Um, okay, on the board. So you can uh, write one over t dt 
r of t over r bar to some power k. And then k is equal to one will be approximately this one. And uh, with, with the logarithm being kind of partial, <laughs> partial power. But k is equal to two will be variance and k is equal to three are high order, high order things. Okay. Okay. So I think we covered um, the information in neural circuits. And then um, some practical applications. So you can um, uh, think of measure, quantify information. <laughs> And one thing to notice that, um, let's see, this is firing rate. And um, this is um, information in bits per spy. So you can see that, um, so there will be two, two comments about this. So one of them practical is that this relay neuron conveys more information than the incoming neuron. But also it says that per spike, you're not limited to one bit, which is, I think, a good, good to know statement. And let's go over it, why is that the case? So if I have a binary neuron and the probability of firing goes between zero and one, then uh, information between, uh, uh, I will just draw on the board. So the information will be, let's see. So the, uh, another expression for the information is, um, dx, which is x is the stimulus. Um, no, it's just the entropy of the neural response. So we have um, P of R, then this is P of R log P of R with minus. And uh, so the entropy of the binary neuron between zero and one. So that's equal. Um, maybe Matteo, you can do a better job, um, write it on the board here. So I need um, P log P minus P log P minus one minus p log one minus p. Something pretty. Yeah, I, um, I, I hear some, <laughs> the information transmission is not reliable, <laughs> but I think it um, should be minus P log, P, yeah, like that, minus one minus P log uh, one minus P. So this is the entropy of the neural response. And so for a binary neuron, that's the maximal information it can convey because that's the maximum entropy. And, uh, this quantity here, so that's the entropy of the neural response. If you plot, it looks like this, between zero and one. So maybe make a, let's make a drawing. Um, should be, um, 
as a function of p, the entropy that you have written minus p log p and um, one minus one minus p log one minus p. So we have when, yeah, like that. So we have, what do we have here? So if P is equal to one, then the first term is zero because of the log. And when P is equal to one, then the second term is zero because one minus P is zero. And uh, you know, zero times log of zero in the limit, that's a zero, X log X. So it goes to zero and then when um, P is equal to zero, then the first term goes to zero because P log P goes to zero when P is equal to zero here, yes. And then the other term is um, uh, when P is equal to zero, we have log. And then when P is equal one half, then if we measure, you know, in units of log two, then it will be one on top in the maximum at one half. Yeah, right here. So this statement says that a binary neuron at most can convey one bit of information. So now if we discretize the spike train in um, response windows such that you can have uh, at most one spike per bin, it seems that the maximum rate that the neuron can transmit is one bit per spike. But, you know, when we do the measurement here is uh, we are getting values that are bigger than one. So the trick is, well, first of all, it's somewhat not fair because um, I divided by the rate. So in our equation of the integral dt r of t divided by average r, so that's, that's one part of it. And the second is, this is information, a joint information between um, um, kind of responses and lack of responses. So if the spikes are rare, then when it does happen, it carries a lot of information. So because it is information per spike, it can be more than one. So information per bin has to be less than one, but information per spike has to be, or, or can be bigger than one. So that, I think that's a useful thing to know when you interpret the data. Okay. Any questions here? So in fact, I, when I woke up this morning, I checked my email. There was, a, as I mentioned, there was a question, can a neuron produce more than one bit per spike? But I think he was also asking per bin. So per bin for a binary neuron, you cannot. But imagine that now you have um, many um, you say that my neural response is not limited to one bin, it can be multiple bins. And then zero, one is different from one, zero, and so on. And then you have a, a time sequence. So then um, one can transmit much more information. Any questions about this? So there's a question in the chat by Colin. Um, in which context are the two different entropies used for neuron uh, transmitters? I think uh, refers to Shannon and Rainy entropies, right, Colin? I don't see this question. 
is in the Zoom chat, yes. Yeah, so in which context do you use uh, Rainy Entropies? In, uh, uh, I, I don't see it, but I trust you're um, I just going from auditory things. In which context I do you use Rainy? Rainy Entropies, yes. So the... Um, Sometimes the the the, uh, the only um, I would say so um, I guess two um, two answers that I can offer. One is that from our discussion, whenever you're computing variance, you're actually using the rainy divergence of order two. Second, um, when it so, but this is divergence. You can talk about the uh, Rainy entropy, and um, instead of writing p log p, you write p squared, and you integrate over um, dx. So this is a, a famous problem with um, coincidence counting as a way to estimate probability distribution. Um, this uh, problem is known as the birthday problem. You might um, know. So we are in the room and we ask how many people um, have birthday on the same day. And uh, then the logic goes that um, it, it roughly, I think, for our um, year, like 300 or in the same months. So uh, my memory is that around uh, 30 people, uh, you will start getting coincidences in terms of the number of days. And using, and that's a more reliable measure to estimate the probability distribution, or uh, assuming they're all uniform, kind of um, the, the range of possible values. So mm -hmm. that is um, um, often is um, um, is used. So, for example, with um, um, in the case of the neuron, we. Um, we may not, so generalizing this to words, we have some patterns. The, the number of patterns is astronomical. And I would like to know they're not all equally encountered. And going back to the first lecture, we would like to estimate the size of the typical set. So you can say, um, when I increase the population of neurons, when do I start seeing um, repeated patterns across neurons? And from that number, you can estimate the, the size um, of uh, the, the entropy of the distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the reference for this where I first read it would be in uh, um, Bill Bialik's PRL paper on entropy and information in spike trains. They, so they do mention Rene entropy uh, and this coincidence uh, counting as a tool. But in more colloquially, it is um, this birthday problem. You said how often from the size of the group of people, you can estimate how many months are on this planet, how many years and so on. And usually sometimes it's taken, you know, you're on some unknown planet and you ask this question and you can estimate their period and so on of mm -hmm. orbit. Okay, so we have questions here. Um, um, so the reference is um, um, entropy and information in neural spike trains. I'll look. I'll look for it and put it in the chat. Entropy, yes, okay. And um, how do we prefer a particular entropy over other entropies? Are these entropies connected? 
Um, yes, so my personal preference, so I have a little paper uh, back from 2009 about rainy entropies and uh, discussion of those results indicates that the so you, you have a sequence of uh, you know a family of rainy divergences and the lowest order is the kullback leibler distance so the information that we use and uh, the information is um, being the lowest order um, in any application has the smallest carries the smallest estimation error so that's why it is um, i would say more popular, but I used, um, I encountered only in practical terms, only two of these rainy entropies, one of them second order, which is variance or coincidences. And the other one is the kullback leibler distance. Okay. Okay. So, um, Um, so now, we, so we covered, uh, so you, you shouldn't be surprised when you see more bits per spike than one, and that a neuron can convey more information than one bit if we take into account sequence of words. And um, um, what else? Um, so, uh, Tanya, one question. So, uh, in this uh, slide, in this plot that you are showing, uh, how is it possible that LGN uh, uh, contains, neuron in LGN contain more information than neuron in the retina? Because, I mean, uh, in the end, uh, I mean, they, they, the information that they get come from the retina. So, the data processing inequality would suggest uh, that it should be less. So, I mean, these neurons are less, and these neurons are equal. Are you talking about this point that is within I'm the air bars? I'm talking about the, 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 previous, uh, the previous plot, the previous ah, slide. So, let's see. Uh, let's see. So, if you go back. so, we have a product of three things. Yeah. So, the firing rate is less, uh, more in the retina, less in LGN. The information per spike is greater, and uh, because the spikes are more rare, and the product is a constant. So this line is a line of constant product of information times rate. And now I can tell you in practical term what it means. So here is an example with 10 trials. The gray spikes are retina, and the red spikes are LGN. So you may notice that whenever there is a silence, the first spike in the retina is filtered out, roughly speaking. And then the rest of the spikes are faithfully transmitted. So the firing rate is less, but somehow they're more reliable. And so the um, information in the red spikes per spike is greater and the product is approximately constant. So now, it, obviously, it would not always work for any statistics of uh, retinal spike trains. And uh, the question I was curious about, but I don't know the answer to, is um, what statistics... So numerically, we can, uh, like, um, from the data analysis, we can predict LGN spikes from the retina quite well, uh, using this rule, meaning that whenever there is a silence of 30 milliseconds or more, you skip the first spike and you transmit the rest of the spikes. But there should be a, some special structure to the retinal spike train that uh, would allow this um, information filtering procedure to um, mm -hmm. produce a lot of, um, to maintain information. Mm -hmm that I I don't know so that's an open question to, to study mm. and uh, also another there is another set of papers 
called information from silence. And uh, meaning that really we should, you know, we are talking information per Ben and uh, maybe we will, um, um, maybe it is useful to write this, um, I'll start and maybe Matteo, you can write. Um, uh, on, this, on the left side of the board, we have information of X and Y. Here, no, to the left, yes, here. Yes, this one. So let's write it for the binary spike train. So I have where y is equal to zero or one. So we explicitly write out the term for y equals zero and the term for y equals one. So we have an integral over dx. Uh, I think p of x and spike log p of x given a spike over p of x and given plus, y. yes, so that's right, given y, which is zero or one. Uh, so if I write it like this, so this should be the joint or the conditional. Um, either way, so let's uh, write it as an, um, you want to, to write it, it this way? So like this? Mm. Let's see. I will make it, I have to make this window bigger. Yeah, we can write it as that. So integral dx, p of x, and then y takes specific value zero. Um, y is equal to zero. And then here, p of x, y is equal to zero. And then um, we can erase in the denominator p of y and make the probability distribution conditional. Okay. p of x given y is zero, and then we erase p of y. Okay. And then we have another term just like that, but with y is equal to one. Yes. Uh, plus. So plus, yeah. Dx. Log p of x given y equal one divided by p of x. Okay. All right. So now suppose um, if we say that spikes are rare then p of x and y, um, and y is equal to z zero and p of x are similar. Um, yes. But in principle, if, if we don't want to neglect this, so this is a small contribution, but the first, um, the top row is information in the silence. And then the second row is information in the spike. Mm -hmm. So, you know, both, both contribute. And if the spikes are rare, then information per spike will be large, but you multiply by, so we can write this in the first outside of the log, let's write it as a conditional and then times P of Y equals one. Okay, so Conditional, is, uh, and then uh, p of times p of y. So that's the retinal um, uh, solution. That in the LGN information per spike is uh, larger because they are more rare, and p of x given y is equal to one is more different than p of x. Mm -hmm. But then the p of y is equal to one is also smaller. So mm -hmm. what is in the bracket, it's called information uh, per spike. And then um, P of Y is the rate of spikes. So then the overall becomes information rate. Okay, so this is uh, spike rate, right? Yes. Okay. Mm. 
Okay, so this one, so there is um, some papers which says information from silence. So when we have um, um, kind of combination of spike trains, so instead of y is equal to zero and y is equal to one, but now you can have um, more complicated patterns such as y is equal to, imagine, I'll try to write on the maybe um, my board. Let's see. So imagine that, um, I used to have a whiteboard here. So imagine that Y now is, can have, is a multi-bin quantity, can have zero, zero, one, it can have zero, one, zero, it can have zero, one, one, and zero, 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 one, 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 Suppose it's three bins. So um, one, two, three, four, five, which patterns are we missing? One, zero, one, 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 zero. That's it? One, two, one three. zero, zero. One, zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, so um, in the people will say, um, information from silence. So I can, I can have this pattern here and uh, it conveys some information, but um, imagine that we expand this and now we have four patterns. So we have one, zero, zero, one, and this will carry extra information compared to this pattern. So you will have information from silence because once we not talk about just um, a binary response zero and one, but multi-bin responses. There are papers like that. <clears throat> so I think for now, uh, uh, maybe uh, I will not start a new topic um, uh, in the, because we have only maybe a few minutes left in the lecture period, but I will um, just summarize and say that, you know, my view of the contribution of the information theory is that to neuroscience, it, it shows that neurons can be sometimes very reliable. Um, it quantifies information transmission uh, in a principled way without making hypothesis about what is the specific transformation. These are positive. And um, one could say that maybe such, from a sociological perspective, maybe a potential negative is that without, because it doesn't make any simplifying assumptions, it, it can uh, convey the impression that it's so complicated that we cannot hope to understand the brain because the number of patterns, if I expand the number of bins, increases as two to the n and how we are going to sample this we will never have enough data to sample these problems and uh, so somehow there is a, a feeling of hopelessness that um, <laughs> sometimes is associated with uh, um, and this is just the emotional uh, response to the um, information theory but I would say that there are other counter arguments that some of which I will try to present in subsequent lectures that um, it can offer systematic simplifications to the complexity of the neural code. Hope that's, yeah. uh, so I have a, a general question uh, uh, concerning what you have been telling us. So, so so there is this general strategy uh, in coding in the brain, uh, which which is discussed, uh, which is essentially sparse coding. Uh, so, is, is I mean, uh, is this argument that uh, say sparse coding uh, uh, reduces the say the 
information uh, uh, per second, but increases the information per spike. I mean, is this the, the, the reason why it is uh, uh, a coding strategy that is uh, often used, uh, especially if I understand uh, right, uh, in, uh, say, sensory systems? Yeah, so I would say that the retina example would be um, an example of one interpretation. It's an example of the application of the sparse coding. So you removed some spikes, but the overall information can be minimally affected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically because each spike costs energy, so the retina is um, uh, sending these uh, spikes, but I can make the code more efficient for further processing. That would be one view. Um, another view is um, um, if that was the case, then why, why not make retina <laughs> efficient in the first place? And uh, I, I don't know exactly. So this is, uh, this is, you know, my answer is that the, probably the retina does many different things and the LGN picks out a specific part of it and makes, and therefore it makes it more efficient. But the retina actually projects to not just to LGN, but to other regions. So for example, you might, um, some of you might know there are these, um, um, I think it's useful to know that, you know, we were, we were talking about ganglion cells, but the ganglion cells here um, are not photosensitive themselves. They get their signals from uh, uh, photoreceptors. But then there are other ganglion cells, which are a minority, that are photosensitive. And these are the cells, for example, that set circadian rhythm. So this is the base of the canonic, these cells that are in this graph are a canonical form for the so-called image forming vision, the one that makes us receive shapes. But even in people who are legally blind, in some cases, there were experiences, well, they're legally blind, so let's remove the eye, okay? So then it turns out not good because uh, um, even if the person doesn't have any vision, there are other um, ganglion cells that weakly respond to changes in light intensity and they project to brain regions that set the circadian modulation. So this is just to state that the retina does many different things and the thalamus gets one piece, but then other brain circuits, I think super cosm uh, cosmetic nucleus, get signals that, um, you know, general light intensity signals, more mm -hmm. lower resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, Any question? So if not, maybe we can stop here for today okay. and then uh, we'll continue on Friday. Okay. Th thanks for everybody for your questions and uh, Matteo, thank you for um, uh, teaching. Yeah, <laughs> assistant, yeah. <laughs> teaching okay. me on this. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.